So we are reaching the second part of our symposium, Zoom conference slash opening slash dialogue, where we'll dive even deeper into the critical zone and discuss key concepts in panel discussions. Our de dear colleague, Anit Holzheit, whom you've already met, is going to um, host these live discussions. So we will, she will jump back into the picture in just one second. But before she does that, don't forget that you are most invited to join the conversation on Telegram. We have been a little slow in, yes, come back into the picture. <laughs> so we've been a little slow in following your questions. We have to keep that up a little bit. Um, but uh, we're really interested in giving, passing on your questions, Ika and I. So um, we hope to catch up now. And um, yeah, so Annette, I'm passing the mic on to you, and um, I'm really looking forward to this first round of panel discussion. Thank you, Barbara. So am I. Very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us online for our first session of our Critical Zones panel discussion. We will have a set of four panel discussions spread out over tonight's evening and tomorrow night's evening. Now, what can you be expecting from those panel discussions? In a way, we will jump back to the catalog, which we have just been presenting by Jens and Bruno Latour, and bring a little bit of it to life, because we have three panelists on each section of the panel discussions who have already and also contributed their essays to the catalog, and also they have contributed, if or in case they are artists, artworks to the exhibitions. So telling you so, that brings us back to our Critical Zones exhibition as being a thought exhibition. What are we talking about when we are talking about thought exhibition? In this way, we are adding together in a very unique way created by Bruno Latour and Peter Weibel, artworks, critical discourse, and scientific models. And what are we expecting from that? for the panel discussion? Well, we are talking about concepts. We are talking about models that are used in a very broad field that is fairly new, that is called the critical zones discourse studies or just the critical zone studies. That means that philosophers, scientists of the humanities, but of course, especially of the natural sciences such as biology, biochemistry and so on. We already heard mathematics, physics and we could go on forever. But now let's go back and see who is on the panel. It's my delight to introduce to you the first speaker who is with us tonight from the UK and actually all of them will be from the UK. It is Jan Salasiewicz. Welcome Jan. How are you? Fine, thanks, and very, very happy to be here and to be uh, joining you all on, on this uh, uh, grand adventure, you know, which uh, I, I think is um, uh, truly remarkable. Uh, and as Bruno said, something like one of the, the 16th century voyages, uh, you know, just as uh, uh, difficult and dangerous and, and uh, significant. Let me tell you a little bit who Jan is. Jan is a, has been a professor of paleobiology at University of Leicester. He is, has just turned into emeritus and now has time for different passions because he's also a stratigrapher and a field geologist and what is very important for us tonight. Besides, he's a member of the Anthropocene Working Group of the International Commission on Stratigraphy. So Jan will be our first speaker and he will present to us a talk on the Anthropocene square meter. Before we start with that talk, let me introduce to you our second panelist, which will be Jennifer Gabriz from Cambridge University. Hello, Jennifer. It's great that you are with us. I can already see you, but can you see us and hear us? Yes, I can see you. Thanks um, very much for organizing this panel. I'm looking forward to our conversation very much, and I wish I could be there in the exhibition, which looks stunning, really. So I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Jennifer Gabriz is Chair in Media, Culture and Environment at the Department of Sociology at Cambridge University. What is really great is she leads citizen science projects and is about to start yet another project called Smart Forests, Transforming Environments into Social Political Technologies, which is a project founded by the European Research Council. 
And I also highly recommend to have a look at her website, you will find it easily on the net, to learn more about her projects and books. For tonight, Jennifer has prepared a presentation for us entitled Sensing a Moving Planet. And as you have heard already the two topics of our experts, I can also tell you what the session is about. It will be connected to our first chapter of the exhibition, which is all about observing, observing the Anthropocene and observing the critical zones. And now let us introduce Ayal Weizmann. Ayal Weizmann is with us from London tonight. Ayal is an architect and director of the Research Agency Forensic Architecture at Goldsmiths University of London. He has been working and collaborating with ZKM before and it's our great pleasure to have him with us again for this exhibition because he had a special project on cloud studies which he added to the artworks here and the exhibition and he will be telling us more about it tonight, about this project that has been part or has been becoming part of the exhibition. Dear Ayal, we are delighted to have you. Can you hear I'm us? I'm almost heartbroken that I cannot see the, the opening and the installation, but I'm really happy to join you remotely. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. And having to ask Bruno, you hear us all right as well? I'm here and I'm delighted to have a uh, three friends of mine and also three authors of a catalog and three ways of developing observatories to the extreme case in the case of Jennifer because of the study she does of a mass of instruments as we will just hear. And uh, of course, with the inventor of forensic uh, architectures, which has pushed the empiricist uh, look at an amazing level of detail, which is exactly the sort of detail we need to study the critical zone. As to Jan, he knows that he is Mr. Anthropocene and actually the inventor in many ways, not of the word, but of the concept. So I'm delighted to be with them tonight. Wonderful. So we are ready to roll the first um, prepared speech, the impulse speech by Jan Salasiewicz. The Earth is changing um, as we move from the Holocene uh, of 11,000 years of stability into the uh, Anthropocene um, uh, of um, uh, unknown scale and duration, uh, but certainly something different and something um, uh, uh, more complicated for us to live in. How do we understand it? Um, the Earth is very big, um, very complicated. Uh, big relative to us, uh, complicated even re in relation uh, to almost anything else in the cosmos. Um, the changes from the Holocene to the Anthropocene uh, are uh, often hard to see, often hidden from us. Um, they vary greatly from place to place around the Earth. Um, and they're often described scientifically uh, in terms... Uh, uh, like uh, parts per million and terajoules and nanograms, uh, which makes them more than a little abstract um, for many people, uh, myself included. So, uh, how can we bring it home, make it more understandable? Um, we can take one square meter of the Earth's surface, and that's one of 510 trillion square meters of the Earth's uh, surface, uh, and give it um, its own share of Anthropocene change and Anthropocene novelty uh, to help us uh, appreciate uh, what we're all living through. Uh, so it's a square metre. Um, we can see it, we can stand on it. Um, it's a four-dimensional square metre, you know, in, in company with many other geological metres and areas. Uh, because uh, it, it, it has a, a, a depth, a, a volume, a, a mass, uh, and it's, uh, it's also changing, so it's changing through time um, uh, at human rates and not even at, at geological rates. So um, let's get its basic mass and framework. Um, it will weigh something of the order of 50 kilograms. Um, uh, that is the, the one square meter's share 
uh, of the something like 30 trillion tons of things that we have um, uh, made, constructed, uh, uh, um, taken apart again, thrown away, uh, and all of the rubble and, and soil and material um, that we take and use and move um, uh, as, as we live. Um, uh, about half of that mass will be urban mass uh, of one form or another, you know, either uh, bits of buildings, broken buildings, foundations, uh, the subsoil and, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, on this average square meter, we're roughly uh, ankle deep, uh, we might say, in, in Anthropocene matter. Um, the components uh, are many and various. Uh, we could go on all day. Um, we could go on for a week um, um, uh, listing them. But let's take some of the the, um, the most obvious, visible, um, recognizable ones. Uh, uh, concrete will be one of them. You know, so uh, around the earth, it's about um, uh, half a trillion tons of concrete being made now, uh, mostly in the last uh, few decades. Uh, uh, so that we, we have a, 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 a kilogram of concrete um, on our square meter as a lump, um, or we can cover very delicately uh, our uh, square meter with a, a two millimeter thick layer of, of concrete. Uh, there will be plastic, um, another novelty, a, a real novelty, uh, not seen since the mid 20th century. Uh, and now um, the square meter's share of it um, is enough uh, to cover it, it loosely and generously in a layer of standard kitchen um, cling film or plastic wrap. Um, parts of it will be a little bit burnt, uh, parts of it may be torn up, uh, parts of it may be in little fibres, uh, as in the fibres we shed from our new plastic clothes all the time. Um, uh, but our, our square metre uh, will have its plastic Covering, um, there'll be other materials. There'll be aluminium uh, again, uh, uh, as a pure metal, uh, a novelty. Uh, enough here, maybe, to have a let's say a, a scrap of cigarette paper uh, on the square meter. Um, iron, uh, there'll be quite a bit more iron and steel. Um, you know, enough to make a few uh, nails and screws. Um, uh, and then we can go on and on and on in, in different materials. Uh, uh, you know, each to have their, their infinitesimal share, you know, of, of the square meter. Um, other materials, let's go into chemistry. Um, uh, carbon is, 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 is one. Uh, it, it's a big part of our life. Um, it, it powers our life. Um, uh, so beneath our square meter, uh, we'll have taken a, um, a, a decent size lump of coal, let's say, uh, few hundred grams um, uh, and a cupful of oil uh, and those will be burnt you know and uh, about half of the gas the carbon dioxide is still hanging up in the air uh, around the planet it's about a, a trillion tons or so um, for our square meter therefore we have a, a couple of kilograms uh, of carbon dioxide uh, which makes a, a layer uh, of pure gas uh, about uh, a meter thick so roughly um, uh, chest height to an adult, uh, head height to a child. Uh, and that metre, uh, 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 you know, so our square metre is now a, a cube, uh, roughly, of, of metre in size. Uh, that is growing uh, at, at about um, half a millimetre a week. We have to keep adding to, to this layer of, of gas. Uh, uh, and... Not all of the gas, of course, is, is quite perfectly burnt. So the little bits that are unburnt uh, make up smoke. Uh, and smoke particles are, are things called spherical carbonaceous particles. They're, they're tiny, microscopic, very tough. Uh, and there will be thousands of them uh, on each square metre now of the Earth's surface, including our Anthropocene square metre. Uh, part of... The effect of that, the direct effect of burning, and the much larger um, effect of heating uh, through the greenhouse effect of the carbon dioxide um, is to heat up the earth a little bit more. So uh, the effect of that on our square meter is to have a, a continuously burning uh, a Christmas tree type bulb uh, uh, 
you know, adding about a, of about a, a, a one, one and something watt bulb. Uh, and that is enough burning continuously to do things like melt ice. Uh, so uh, ice is melting. Uh, we know it's been melting uh, faster and faster, particularly in the last 20 years or so. Uh, and so our square meter is now flooded uh, with something like um, uh, 10 centimeters of water. So we're splashing through the water uh, on the square uh, uh, meter. Uh, and again, it's growing um, uh, at, at the rate of something like uh, two to three millimeters currently a year uh, uh, as the water gets deeper. Um, uh, geologists look at fossils, so humans are making fossils uh, of all different sorts. You know, we, we are now uh, have made a variety of, of fossils, techno fossils, we call them all the things we make that fossilize, uh, that is arguably now great in the diversity of all the fossils uh, we can find um, you know, in the Earth's strata or have found uh, uh, to date. So many millions of kinds and uh, how can we symbolize them you know, on a square meter? Um, you know, perhaps maybe uh, we can go from a, a tiny fragment of a cigarette end, uh, many trillions discarded of, of those, uh, to maybe a tiny part of a computer chip you know, uh, for its, its, its wider significance. Um, and life, life also fossilizes. Our square meter has uh, something uh, like five kilograms of life, living matter uh, on it. Um, that's diminished, that's shrunking. That's about half of the amount of life that existed before humans began to alter the amount of life, uh, largely in this case by cutting down uh, trees. Uh, so we may have a, a you know, a shrub, a rather shrunken, a rather sickly-looking shrub, um, diminishing, uh, uh, you know, as as time goes on, uh, joined by oh maybe, uh, 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 you know, the ghosts of, of vanished insects above, and perhaps things like a, a, a fragment of a, a supermarket chicken bone below uh, as a new Anthropocene animal, by now far, by far um, the commonest bird you know, in, in the world. Uh, so uh, we have a square meter, we can keep on tending it, um, measuring it, modifying it almost infinitely. Uh, and if we keep looking at that, uh, perhaps we will have a better idea um, uh, of how this uh, planet of ours um, is changing all around us. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for this wonderful picture you made for us of the Anthropocene square meter. Since I have read about it in the catalog and have watched your video, I always take it with me when I'm somewhere. But now let's ask Bruno about his thoughts on the Anthropocene square meter and questions he has to Jan. It's very great to see uh, Jan in both video, one in video and one in another video in real time. Um, you know, the traditional uh, motto is that man is the measure of everything. And uh, I'd ask Jan to summarize the opposite version, which is a simple scale to measure the, everything that man does. And he actually managed to do a square meter, which is the scale that you see in when you do a cartography and you, you need a little scale to get an idea of the size. Well, that's what uh, Jan did. And I have one question, Jan, because in your paper, in the, in the chapter, uh, and what you repeat, you don't mention too much uh, the entity which is now bothering us, uh, namely the microbes. And uh, they are said to be very, very heavy as well. I mean, have you factor them inside your scale? Well, that is a, a, a wonderfully complicated um, uh, and significant part uh, of the square meter, you know, uh, as with many other hidden small creatures, like, you know, the Maya fauna, little creatures the size of protozoans, but fully grown animals, uh, which team in soils um, uh, and we don't really know how they're changing. Uh, uh, microbes uh, have played to different rules than normal 
animals and plants, if you like, you know, they, they have this thing called horizontal gene exchange. They, they, uh, uh, they exchange genetic material. So even as we uproot forest, dig um, gardens, uh, build cities, um, trying to find out what the microbes are doing is, uh, uh, again, I think one of the big questions for the critical zone work. Uh, because what the microbes do ultimately drives everything else. Um, so, um, yes, you, you have, you know, with an erring skill, uh, hit upon, um, uh, you know, part of the square meter that needs to be built up, um, developed and, and elaborated for sure. Jan, I have also a question following Bruno Latour. Do you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Because the book of Alexander von Humboldt was called Cosmos. And now we have a new book by Lil Margulis and her son, Dorian Sagan, which is called Microcosmos. This is precisely the point. What is, does it mean that we shift now observing the microcosmos more than the cosmos? Is this a ground for the Anthropocene? That we are now looking with new instruments, really in the smallest entities of Gaia, like microbes? Yes, for sure. Yes, and, and, and there are so many places to look now that um, uh, uh, would have, uh, I think, uh, excited Humboldt's um, attention and interest. Uh, for instance, when we build cities, what is the microcosmos that is taking place beneath the pavement, uh, beneath the streets, beneath the buildings? Uh, there is some kind of biology down there uh, which uh, has its own version of the critical zone. Um, and there's been nothing really quite like it in the last four and a half billion years of, of the Earth. Uh, so we are creating new microcosmoses all the time. Uh, there's one beneath us right now here. Um, so again, you know, uh, uh, something to explore. We have um, a small question from kind of an under microcosm, which is our Telegram community. And apparently it has triggered kind of a conversation there. So I'm just going to put it back into the conversation and see also maybe it's a question to all the experts. I'm just going to read it out. It's by Anna. She says, Many speakers today have been using medical metaphors in relation to the role of critical zones investigations. That is very interesting, but potentially troubling in the way it evokes power inequalities, the power of experts, how it configures the investigators. It would be interesting to hear the speakers reflect on that a bit more, especially in the light on the war of the virus today, and she's asking what are other metaphors, not medical and not military, which we could use to inform our attention to Gaia or the critical zone. So she's asking what metaphors, what other metaphors we could use. I think that's a very interesting question. Maybe, maybe Bruno, maybe you want to start with that. Um, so because you, you've been using, uh, I mean, you're a master of the metaphors. So maybe, <laughs> maybe you could start and then, then we could see if, if uh, somebody else of the panel has an idea about that. Well, the question is a very good question. I might be influenced by the coronavirus and the fact that I myself had it, and I have a different view of the uh, danger of a medical uh, metaphor. But I don't want to um, push the metaphor too far. And um, the, 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 the question is that the crisis, the, 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 Anna is completely right. I mean, the crisis cannot be framed only in medical terms. The medical here is a metaphor of a crisis. So, uh, I mean, let probably, I mean, sure, Jan has a lot of answers to that, but when we have heard uh, Jennifer's uh, version of the uh, infrastructure studying the earth, uh, we might have a different answer, but I let Jan Robin now answer. Yes, it's, 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 a, it's another great question because how we feel about things, uh, I think does alter the way how we act, uh, how we think, how we study, how we react. Uh, and and uh, yes, it's quite right. If uh, medical metaphors, um, you know, can have, you know, perhaps a, a sobering, a depressing effect, 
um, uh, within geology, if you like, because we, we study the past, you know, we are, if you like, um, the pathologist of rocks, though we rarely think of ourselves uh, like that. Um, the idea we more have in our heads, I think, is one, uh, again, relating to what uh, Bruno introduced this talk, uh, which is one of uh, the great, the exploration, the adventure. Uh, and the adventure, of course, uh, doesn't mean, you know, success and happiness all the time. It, it has its fair share of uh, mistakes and, and tragedy, uh, but it, it, it gives a kind of flexibility and ad adventure of approach, um, you know, and, and one can have um, uh, good humor as part of it too. Answer right back. No, I don't want to answer, but I'm thinking that the one who pushed the metaphor, mythical metaphor, the furthest is actually Eyal. Mm. <laughs> because the very notion of forensic architecture is exactly in that direction. So maybe we will have the answer when he has the time to speak. Maybe he wants to answer now. I don't know. You are, uh, I don't I, want to. I don't know. I, I usually am um, wary of the very. Um, formation of taking metaphors from the literary to the political domain and in particular seeing things historically when things were starting to be seen in terms of epidemiology and viruses we are ending up with controls of different types controls of revolutionary ideas controls of migration race-based control etc and I think it's best, it's best, sorry, to leave that um, issue to be to be handled in its own terms, in the medical terms. Think, of course, at how it intersects with other things. But I'm um, I'm extremely worried whenever I hear that um, the viral contagion of that we are experiencing now is informing our thinking in terms of other. Uh, formation. The, the, the historical experience has been horrific with translating epidemiology to political ideas. Oh, this is, um, sorry, if I may, because this is such a wonderful cue to another question that we get from the audience, and I would actually like to address this one to Jennifer. Um, and it picks up beautifully where you just left us, Eyal, because it's Jonas, and he asks, do we need new narratives myths, translations, and ideas to grasp, to grasp the upheavals of the Anthropocene and ultimately activate them politically. So maybe, Jennifer, do you, could, you cut, could you take on this question? It's a bit complicated, of course, but... <laughs> um, yes, well, absolutely, I would say we need new narratives and new stories. Um, and in fact, I don't really even need to do that much work to make that case, um, since I think in the introduction to the Critical Zones, catalog that's very much where the introduction leads, which is to refer to another speaker who will be um, presenting um, in a few days, Donna Haraway, who has spoken exactly to the ways in which stories can generate forms of worlding. Mm -hmm. um, we see a similar um, approach to the different sorts of stories and worlds that emerge within um, indigenous practices, within differentiated multiple ways of inhabiting um, worlds that are not only within a sort of universal narrative of, of science even uh, necessarily. So this can be a way to think about how to pluralize uh, the narratives that we might draw on so that we're not only referring to medical or militaristic registers, but in fact thinking about entirely different registers of being. So I would say absolutely um, we need different stories and we probably need different ways of composing um, and thinking about the authorship of those stories also as something that goes beyond the human. Absolutely. So I think this is a wonderful moment maybe to dive more also into your work and um, have a look at uh, your lecture and your impulse for this panel discussion. Jennifer. Hello, I'm Jennifer Gabriz from the University of Cambridge. Thank you for the invitation to present work on Sensing a Moving Planet as part of the Critical Zones exhibition and mosaic launch event. Beneath the Earth's surface, 
Seismic sensors capture the everyday movements of the ground, the intensity of hurricanes crashing into land, and the ricochet of tectonic plates that signal geological arrangements across deep time. EarthScope is a research project that studies the moving Earth through such sensors installed in a portable array across the U.S. and parts of Canada. The Earth is on the move, and sensors are capturing its activities. There are now billions of sensors operating, not just in the bedrock, but also across cities, forests, oceans, glaciers, soil, aquifers, rivers, lakes, and air, along with any number of sensor-carrying organisms. If you were to take a transect through the planetary critical zone, you might find sensors installed in every milieu. Sensors observe, assess, synthesize, and manage measurements of Earth processes. They typically operate as networks to detect, analyze, and actuate responses to environmental events. In this way, they materialize as larger ensembles for tuning in to planetary troubles as well as acting on them. I will traverse a hypothetical transect through these domains to consider how sensors describe and propose ways of inhabiting a moving Earth. Are these propositions best suited to building collective, just, and sensitive planetary relations? Layers of soil and rock burst with sensing activity. The threat of major earthquakes has led to seismic sensor installations in multiple cities worldwide, along with early warning systems and citizen sensing apps. At the same time, there are many zones not monitored by sensors, including oceanic spaces, where data gaps can lead to a less rapid response to earthquakes and tsunamis, as happened in Southeast Asia in 2004. But sensing is not just a project of protecting the planet or averting catastrophe, but also is used to facilitate optimization and extraction operations. Subterranean spaces are monitored for the presence of oil and gas, minerals and water. Remote sensing and LIDAR techniques have become a way to address water shortages and to use technological infrastructures developed through military research to sense resources underground. Here, the movement of sensors across domains requires political work to contend with the thorny relations that form as these technologies constitute the resource of planetary materials. Waterways are sensed for elevation changes, currents and circulation, salinity, pollution, and underwater activity. Oceans have become observatories so full of sensors that scientists can monitor them remotely. From their laboratories and living rooms, onlookers can watch the unfolding drama of ocean acidification and biodiversity collapse. The movements of ships across watery spaces can also mobilize activist practices of countersensing, where vessel sensing techniques meant for shipping and military activities are instead used to locate and rescue migrants. Communities are also installing sensors for early detection of floods and for monitoring water quality. As we move through the transect of this critical zone, the sensing of watery spaces becomes evident less as an act of gentle fluidity and more as a condition of inundation and bordering, contestation and collapse. Organisms are also on the move as they migrate, respire and transform their activities are multiply tracked and monitored through sensor processes. Migrating animals carry GPS collars and RFID tags that communicate with satellites. Humans carry wearables and pollution sensors, and nanoscale and wearable sensors adhere to vegetation to detect plant traits. Components from the natural world are made into sensors so that eels, lichens, elephant seals, and many other organisms can be monitored as biosensors, which record the effects of pollution and changing weather in their movements and patterns. These more organismal modes of sensing, however, demonstrate just how pluralistic the many ways of experiencing and navigating planetary zones are, whether monitoring the journeys of migrating animals 
or observing the carbon capture, capturing capacities of plants. In forest locations, sensor networks form as Internet of Trees installations, which as a modified version of the Internet of Things, monitor wildfires and drought, as well as tree growth and sap flow. Forests are becoming smart through the use of sensor networks, machine learning, datification, and participation. These projects are meant to watch sensors as they breathe in real time. Along with smart forests, there are now smart cities, smart oceans, smart agriculture, all operating as configurations of sensors and data analytics, machine learning and networks to sense and actuate, manage and optimize the operations of ecosystems. Yet these sensor installations are not just ways of describing environments, they are also ways of bringing them into being as socio-political worlds with often disparate power relations. From ground-based sensors to wearables, drones and satellites, multiple sensors are drifting through more atmospheric spaces to capture pollution levels, temperature and humidity, the circulation of air, light levels and more. Satellites monitor global distributions of air pollution, while citizen sensing projects use infrared sensors and particle counters to create alternative maps of pollution as it is experienced within the environment. Geiger counters track radiation levels from nuclear fallout, and citizen data from grassroots projects present new formations of facts while transforming the environmental problems under study. In these spaces, sensing tracks the transience and destructiveness of polluted and changing atmospheres, which in turn contribute to the need to sense human bodies, where ecological destruction returns in the form of disease and pandemics. By taking a transect through the Earth's critical zone, this short summary of sensors outlines how a moving Earth becomes sensible, and yet sensors capture the moving Earth only partially at best. The smart digital planet that materializes here is one that requires addressing the ways in which environmental data and monitoring might also foreclose as much as propose different planetary inhabitations. There are just as many events, interactions, and relations that collide with the descriptive ambitions of these monitoring and experiencing technologies. And yet, by tuning into the experiences of multiple, multiple organisms and environments across the critical zone, it might also be possible to expand the registers and operations of sensation that become evident. Such descriptive and sensing practices demonstrate how any project to sense a common planet will arrive at all that is uncommon about planetary relations and inhabitations. These planetarities signal how practices of observation involve ways of experiencing that are also propositions for how to collectively inhabit a moving, as well as a differentially equal, unequal, Earth. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion now that we follow. Thank you, Jennifer, for your contribution, because you deal with this very delicate subject. Bruno has written in my citation, we must become more sensitive. Yeah? And normally, people think about sensors, they think about our natural organs. They think our natural organs, eye and ears, etc., are enough for sensors. But now we learn that we need artificial man-made sensors, uh, which resist uh, the environment, the condition of the environment, and it's also uh, are more sensitive than our natural sensors, our natural organs. Uh, therefore, I say, my question is, can you, can you confirm that the development of artificial sensors, extending, extending our natural sensors, uh, are something which is very important for our survival on the planet? So yes, the, the question of um, do sensors augment or extend our senses is something I've tried to think about rather differently, um, which is to think instead about how sensors challenge the usual configurations of subjects and environments. So rather than think of a discrete human with the proverbial five senses, how do sensors actually remake our relations with environments, with other entities, so that we might tune in to the capacities of a migrating bird um, or to a polluted waterway or atmosphere 
so that we think about um, our relations to these entities differently, not only through our ability to see or hear them, but also by our ability to um, be affected or have different registers of sensation because of the pollutedness um, of environments, because of the warming up of the planet and so on. So this is a way of thinking in that kind of holobiontic uh, mode um, that the critical zone might um, force us um, to, to encounter, which is how we are not discrete individuals with fully formed sensing apparatuses that can merely then be augmented by technologies, but rather our very environmental inhabitations are differently configured along with the technologies that we use and that those are always also bound up in power dynamics. So the ability to sense is not uh, merely a sort of universal generic process, but in fact, it's something that's always shifting in relation uh, to these different configurations. It's a very interesting and slightly uh, funny to hear a Jennifer talk with uh, in between uh, the man who invented the Anthropocene and the man who invented forensic architectures because both of them certainly I'd like to hear what uh, Jan think of the possibility of making a square matter completely equipped with all the instruments that Jennifer talked, but I'd like to hear Elia as well on what he means, what he makes of this uh, incredible amount of data which is provided by the instrument Jennifer talks about but also, as he's always very worried about the mass of uh, surveillance, which can be added to the already massive surveillance. So does it help his job or not? I'd like to hear both of them about that. So, uh, Ayal, could you first answer? Yeah, I, I'm uh, always fascinated with Jennifer's conceptualization of um, sensing, which is in fact connected to the way that Bruno taught us to rethink aesthetics. So in a way, how do we aestheticize a particular situation? And I think that what it, what it um, requires us to do is not only to use those electronic prosthetic sensors that we are locating in places, but to look at any material transformation as a sensor of a phenomena which is outside of itself. So you'd have analog sensors, you have digital sensors, and the capacity to describe a situation comes from the relations between them, i.e. from the way that, you know, in, in, our, in our forensic investigations, when something happens, it's the relation between the capacity of the brain to register something that has happened, the capacity of concrete on a building to register traces, perhaps of bullet holes, etc. The capacity of grass to register what uh, vehicles have passed over it or um, to what extent toxic materials were used. The capacity of air to hold information. And in a sense, what one needs to do is to have the imagination to compose something with them. So it's not only uh, a matter of volume, but a matter of how you are actually relating sensors that are completely ontologically different. Um, digital, human, uh, material, uh, gases, etc. cetera. And, um, and, and this, is, this is somehow the kind of condition we are living in. So for example, from, from the forensic architectural perspective, since you asked uh, Bruno, um, we, we were used to a kind of a situation like in the Arab Spring or the kind of the, the, the wars that um, happened after the collapse of the Arab Spring, but you would have about 10, 20 videos of an incident and with which we would try to reconstruct something. We are working now with activists in Hong Kong. We, in fact, we were asked by several members of the protest movement to help them build a, a, a case file against the repression by the authorities. And the amount of data that exists there simply by phones is impossible to humanly process. 
Um, the amount of environmental data that exists registering tear gas quantity is enormous. And we need also a capacity to process, to rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning. We need a kind of a human machinic way of composing and understanding these. We have a question from the audience, I just heard. Yes, um, we have a question which would actually, um, it does lead back to Jennifer because um, it's, uh, how does sensing sensitize those who are sensing and how does it become political or lead to care? I really like that one. No, I think that's a that's a really great great question in terms of how um, we become sensitive. And uh, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a sensitive moment with a more than human ear. Um, but uh, I think this is this is a political question because the sort of arts of noticing that um, Anna Singh um, discusses are are not necessarily given. So how does something come to attention? Is that something that occurs? through technological apparatuses? Is that something that requires certain relations to take hold? Um, and then what is done with that noticing? How is evidence mobilized? Um, how does that form different collectives who are able to become mutually sensitive to situations that can generate forms of care? So this is something um, that I've certainly written about um, before of thinking of care not as something that is uh, normative or prescriptive, but as something that also requires a kind of responsiveness to situations of pollution and harm, for instance, there, for which there might not be a pre-given script. So I see this very much as a, a kind of um, processual way to understanding sensing, not nearly as making something visible, which is the usual way of understanding, um, for instance, how to act on pollution as a way of becoming sensitive, but perhaps to draw in conditions of um, health, environmental justice, asthma, pollution, uh, more than human toxicity, um, as conditions that are emerging and require arts of noticing that are still in the making. So how do we develop concepts, stories, uh, vocabularies, practices, and interventions um, for working with these conditions? Thank you so much, Jennifer, for answering and also posing the in, um, important questions. I think we could link this very beautifully now to Ayal Weizmann's talk. Mm. Are we, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Ayal, Ayal um, please start um, okay. so we can yeah. have a good connection. I think that, um, I mean, strange um, uh, position here in this exhibition because also a very extensive video essay uh, that Forensic Architecture contributed um, is on display online and in the exhibition. So perhaps uh, I will not go so detailed into the images, but I want to start actually with something that may appear completely different. I want to start with my friend, Ashil Mebembe. And unfortunately, a topic that is hotly contested in Germany. And I do not invoke Ashil Mebembe because of the offensive and ludicrous accusation against him, something that could simply be dispelled by anyone that wants to read news from the Middle East and from Israel in Arabic and in Hebrew, would see that this is absolutely the language that is being used to discuss the situation. But because of an essay I read this morning by Ashil, uh, that is titled The Universal Right to Breathe, where he reads the COVID-19 crisis against a backdrop of the attack on breathing. And this is what Ashil Mebembe is writing. And I think in many ways, it's an answer to his critics. Before this virus, humanity was already threatened with suffocation. If war there must be, it must be against everything that condemns the majority of humankind to premature cessation of breathing. Everything that fundamentally attacks the respir respiratory tract. Everything that in the long reign of capitalism has constrained entire segments of the world population, entire races to difficult panting breath and life of oppression. 
To come through this constriction would mean that we conceive breathing beyond its purely biological aspect, and instead as that which we hold in common, that which by definition eludes calculation, by which I mean the universal right to breath. And I think that what, uh, what is interesting for me in, um, uh, in sharing with you is in fact the project that forensic architecture is uh, presenting here in the, in, the, in the exhibition is a project called Cloud Studies. So I think Bruno um, already introduced forensic architecture as being um, a forensic agency perhaps of a different sort. Uh, we are only looking at human rights violations. Uh, we are working with communities that are suffering repression uh, of different kinds and bringing cases uh, against states using um, analytical and scientific uh, means. But uh, whereas most of our cases really engaged with things like police violence, uh, reconstructing the way in which police abuse, abuses its um, weapons and power, um, sites of bombing, we talked about Hong Kong and Syria, uh, something that was always a limit problem of forensics for us were clouds. And increasingly, we started seeing the weaponization of the air uh, affecting populations in risk. This particular image, I think, speaks somehow to what Ashil Mbember has um, termed the right to breathe. These are American soldiers on the border to Mexico firing tear gas. And what we could see is that the tear gas cloud in fact, forms in the US and crosses the border. So the territory, the common territory of the cloud, something that we could call a negative commons, uh, that cloud does not read really international border. However, law does. If it is used in the US, tear gas is an allowed uh, substance. The police can use it in their own country. The minute it crosses international border, it becomes a chemical weapon. And I think that we need to look at the way in which law and space, the old divisions of borders, um, do not really contain, are unable to contain the logic uh, of clouds. So tear gas here in Tahrir Square. Um, white phosphorus used by Israel in Gaza, another type of what uh, Peter Sloterdijk would call airquakes, uh, events that make us understand that the clouds today that we are experiencing are not simply meteorological or natural, but a technological or a certain hybrid between uh, an environmental and technological. They are kind of, um, forms of assembly. Clouds uh, are a limit condition of forensics because forensics is based on a simple principle that every contact leaves a trace. Cloud studies is forensics without a trace. It is the attempt to understand an object in metamorphosis and transformations. So when we speak about the critical zones, and this is forensic architecture presenting an analysis that effectively managed to contribute to banning white phosphorus um, uh, use in, in, uh, in, in Gaza by Israel, it's a presentation in the UN in our evidence. We need to understand that the critical zone is a zone of life, of course, but being a zone of life, it is a zone of conflict. And being a zone of conflict, it's a zone of politics. And politics is what requires those commons to emerge. Here, another type of clouds that we are mapping in a different way, herbicidal drift, um, methane, uh, another project that we've undertaken and presenting uh, in the exhibition. So commons, the idea of 
negative comments um, and an understanding that in cloud studies, very much like in the history of art, clouds were always between shape and fog. Um, the problem of drawing clouds um, from the beginning of modernity was that simply clouds were moving faster than the painter hand could capture them. Uh, they had to be imagined rather than described. There needed to be different techniques in order to describe them. And it is interesting that Ruskin, who was kind of the patron saint of the Cloud Appreciation Society, um, thinks that modern painter, the contemporaneity in painting begins when cloud descend from the air, from the skies to the ground, when they become screens of refraction. And for us also in undertaking cloud studies, we always try to negotiate and move, meander between shape and fog, between the experience of being in something, of being in a cloud, the way to which it affects your physique. This is chlorine in Aleppo, in Syria, the way it blurs your vision and um, create a kind of anesthetics, the opposite of an aesthetic sensing. It numbs your ability to smell, to see, sometimes to hear, and the, the, the necessity of describing. But working on clouds across scales, it makes us sometimes think that those um, conflicts that we map, tear gas and white phosphorus and all the other cloud weapons that we are using are almost like the smoke in a wind tunnel that allow us to understand a much bigger condition. Oh, in fact, a condition that, that cuts across scale, that is non-scalar. Uh, the cloud that was created by the forest fires uh, in Indonesia uh, is continental uh, in scale. It's planetary in scale. And the question is, what should emerge at the shadow of that cloud? If that cloud is a commons, as Ashil Mibembe says, or perhaps a negative commons, it is that the certain citizenry of air need to rise and organize itself in a different way than the way in which it is cut by the national borders. So that cloud that cuts continentally across Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, all the way to the Philippines, and the one that on the US-Mexico borders have just entered through uh, the fence and violated international law need to be thought to a certain extent together. I think we are all now citizens of uh, the toxic cloud, whether it is here, um, a, a protest uh, in Hong Kong or in other places. It requires, it behoves a certain type of solidarity. And another issue that we encounter in forensic architecture when we are describing clouds, and this is perhaps a photograph of a, of a mushroom cloud that is perhaps the most controversial image in the entire Syrian civil war. It is a cloud that was created by a sarin bomb in a, a town called Alatimina in 2017. And bombs like that are also information bombs. So this is a term um, uh, by Paul Verilio information bomb, the minute they hit the ground, amazing amount of media, arguments, counter arguments, negations and debate uh, appear online. So we need to also think about the cloud as a certain kind of epistemological fog. These are the Twitter debates simply about chemical strikes in Syria, but you could do the same for climate change, or the responsibility for the forest fires in Australia, uh, et cetera. There is something about cloud and about the, the, the way in which this optical blur turn into epistemological fog that requires that sticking with the problem, that require us to create um, 
associations between different types of investigations, those that the people that experience that these clouds firsthand, the people that are affected optically and physically and bodily by it, uh, people, the scientists that can map it from the outside, the journalists that could disseminate these ideas, the lawyers that perhaps could litigate them. We need to create these kind of alliances in order to act within and against that kind of violence that we are subjected to. That's it. Thank you so much, Ayal. I would like to pass on the word to Jan directly because I think there's a good connection between the two of you. Yes, I think, you know, the clouds are, are it's a visible movement of air. Uh, and uh, of course, you, you, you know, they're carried by the invisible components, um, you know, of, uh, uh, of the air, um, in, including things like carbon dioxide and methane, uh, which, can now be made visible as well now by the kind of uh, sensors that, that both Jennifer and Ayol described. Uh, 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 and it, I've often thought that the world would be a different place um, if there were boundaries for um, uh, that applied uh, to uh, the release of greenhouse gases, if every nation Uh, 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 you know, simply stacked up its own carbon dioxide above itself, um, uh, then there would be a, a much more uh, immediate and local uh, greenhouse effect, which might uh, uh, act uh, rather more effectively as a negative feedback than the, the present one is doing. Uh, but uh, 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 yes, I mean, uh, Uh, you know, these insubstantial things, uh, as I have said, uh, are, are having the most substantial uh, of effects. Yes, I think that if, oh, if cartography was developed in order, you know, cartography, the nation state and the empire, right, were developed more or less in relation to each other. The ability to visualize, the ability of undertaking cloud studies would require different political formations. Uh, because the minute that you are able to describe, you also create, you create different kinds of communities. And I think that this is, um, there's always a relation between the, the, the capacity to describe and kind of political formations that are very interesting. For In Hong Kong, we're speaking about Hong Kong continuously, We, we worked with the activists that were actually measuring levels of tear gas across the city. And they have looked at the way in which the political map in Hong Kong changed. And in fact, people that were bodily exposed to breathing and sensing tear gas have changed their political affiliation or had, had more inclination to do that to the extent that the shape of the cloud redrew the political boundaries um, in, in Hong Kong in a really interesting way. Well, thank you so much to all the participants uh, up until now. I love how we've gone from the very scientific data to the cloud to uh, even an art historical uh, kind of background from, from cloud drawing and then also the political aspect of sensing and now of course we um, obviously unfortunately have to wrap up this discussion quite soon but i wanted to do that with a lovely question from the audience um, that kind of opens up a lot uh, again but could we could use it for a poetic kind of end um, it's a question by oliver and uh, he says how do we develop our sensing capacity What could guide us in that process? And how do we develop curiosity and search for novelty going from there? And I would like to pass this question first to Jennifer, and then um, maybe Bruno, maybe you could give us a closing statement uh, as an answer. Jennifer, please. <laughs> well, I'm like, I think this is a really challenging question about how to develop sensing capacity um, is that something undertaken as an individual pursuing a sort of project of self-betterment? Um, I would say probably not. 
Um, I think instead this is perhaps thinking of different ways of tuning in across collectives, relations, um, and environments and rethinking subjects exactly in those sorts of ways we heard in the opening um, to the session tonight in terms of Lynn Margulis's work on um, holo bias. Also, I would draw on uh, work by Alfred North Whitehead on the subject Superject, Isabel Stengers, and other people who have troubled the way that we think about the subject as something that would um, merely refine uh, its abilities to be more sensitive and more aware? How do we instead think about ourselves as already entangled with so many other entities and environments? Um, how is this moment of a zoonotic disease shifting the way that we live, one of those instances, and how do we think about that as a possibility for living otherwise? So I would say it's, it's about um, perhaps remaking the boundaries of the subject uh, tuning into environments and relations um, and finding new sensory capacities within those situations. Um, Bruno, would you, would you like care to answer to that? I, I, I mean, this was a great uh, panel and I am very moved in a way because uh, what uh, the three of them uh, describe is the whole situation that we try to uh, materialize in the catalogue and in the exhibition. In a way, uh, Jan provided us with the big question, which is this in, in introduction of this cloud, so to speak, which is the Anthropocene, uh, which we have to live in. And we are a bit short of breath since uh, Jan uh, introduced it. And I think Eyal uh, provided a marvelous description of what we try to do which is to say that if we get out of a cartographic state, which was invented basically uh, with cartography, is perfectly right. If we begin to map like Jennifer tried to do with all its instruments, uh, we need another state formation. And of course, this is a great question for the next uh, decade, which is how do we manage to uh, with all of his instruments uh, to manage the state which absorb the shock of the Anthropocene. So I think it was a great panel and I hope it's recorded. And uh, we, we are very grateful uh, for you to have accepted to, to come. Many thanks and I hope we will pursue in the space, hopefully inside the space uh, in a few months. Thank you very much. I would like I would like to link uh, the comment at the end to link, make a link to, to Bruno Latour. Two remarks. In the exhibition, you will have both. We will have the cloud studies of forensic architecture, and we will also have romantic paintings. And say this is precisely what happened. In romantic paintings, we had clouds untouched by, by human people, untouched by human hands. We had an idealized image of nature. Today, we have cloud studies. We show what happens with clouds. Uh, the clouds even can become information bombs. They can become uh, clouds where we store data, and they can become uh, toxic. Uh, so we see the change. Uh, see, we see the effect of the dust evolution of the Anthropocene. And a second remark to uh, Jennifer. Uh, when I understand you correctly, you said sensors are uh, redefining our relationship of our human people to our environment. Uh, and if, if I understand you correctly, it's very important to understand, because when I did this Bruno years ago, the exhibition, uh, making things public, uh, and when he developed this idea of Parliament of Things, we, we, he has a question, how do we represent human interest as a parliament? It's fine. But how do we re represent the interests of non-human actors? For example, do we hear the voice of a river? Yeah? And then we showed two installations that with, with, with artificial sensors, because our eyes and our ears do not hear the voice uh, of the river. But now, we, but now we have developed different sensors, artificial sensors, and with these sensors we can register, uh, and we can represent the voice uh, of human actors, non-human actors like a river. Yeah? And I think the development of sensors is in fact very important for your idea of a parliament of things. And I think this close and this uh, uh, conversation tonight 
clarified a lot of things. Bruno, what do you mean? We have already two hours, so I'm too tired. I need a break. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bruno. And I think we should thank our speakers yes. and uh, let go to the other part of the uh, program, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. If not, Peter, you are going to have all your stuff fall down soon. And I think we should go on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruno. That was my cue, so wonderfully done. Um, we really want to thank um, all the the guest panelists, Eyal, Jennifer, Jan, you were amazing. Thank you so much for enriching uh, this wonderful evening for us. Bruno, also to you, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's really, yes, we have Peter bowing to all of you. Um, I'm, I'm, we, all, we are all joining in that. And as Bruno said, we are now going to take a short five minutes break. We might need a little bit more than five minutes. We'll see about that. Um, you can see uh, that on our screen. It's, it will just say we'll be right back in five minutes. So see you right after that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.